everyone. Um, just let's just quickly recap where we were yesterday. Uh, sorry, on Wednesday's class, and then we'll go back into that example we we left the class off with. Just to put in perspective where we are here, we were looking last time at a spherical particle, and we investigated the forces that act on that particle when it's in a fluid. We had the upward buoyancy force. We had a downward gravitational force. And we also had the final one over there, the drag on the particle. So the drag was the one that we looked at a little bit carefully last time. And we had this equation for the drag force, which is a physical equation. That, um, that works for spherical particles, and AP was that projected area. We then went into looking at how that CD, the drag coefficient value, is calculated, and it's a function of the, the Reynolds number. And there's four regimes that we can consider that. One is a very linear decline. The first one there, Stokes's law, or Stokes's region as it's called. The mid-range up to a Reynolds number of 1,000, where that, that correlation, that linear relationship breaks down. It becomes a little bit more curved. So we see that curve coming down. And that, that curve settles out, and then we're in a flat line. And after that, the, the drag coefficient is constant. So we can use that relationship and solve an unsteady state momentum balance. And we solve that balance by simply assuming we're at steady state. Really, the only reason why we do that is because the unsteady state portion is so fast a couple of seconds and that particle is, is falling at terminal settling velocity. Right, so the unsteady state portion is really not that interesting to us. We're only interested in that terminal settling velocity. And at steady state, the very definition of a terminal settling velocity is steady velocity. Right? So that's why it's the TSV over there. This is the terminal settling velocity, is the velocity at steady state. Someone was asking about that and so that really is the reason why we consider that terminal settling velocity. And you'll see a little bit more um, after the example why this, this velocity is so important to us. This is our main focus. And I left you with the last class with this consideration that that terminal settling velocity really is the main function that causes these particles to settle is the fact that we're getting a difference in density. If that difference in density was non-existent, that particle is perfectly static. There's no movement. So I had asked you then to solve this problem, this example here. And we went through a formal process, at least the first few steps of it. The formal process is where you define what you know and what you don't know. So we did that last time. We won't repeat that again. Explore is where we explored the assumptions around this problem. And then our plan. Our plan is essentially those six steps up over there. And then we got a, a chance to do the problem, or I hope you did at least at home. Okay. So I'll just quickly give a summary of what, that, what your calculations should have looked like in this fourth step, the do. So. So as said up there, you assume Reynolds number is less than 1. And if you do that, you calculate the velocity using the equation here on slide 22. In other words, what we're saying, when Reynolds number is less than 1, we're in Stokes's region. And so that velocity then, you sub into that expression. I won't go through all the, all the values. You can put them in from last class. And you get a value of 2.18 meters per second. Okay, everyone should have found that it's a very simple substitution of all unknown values into that formula. So 2.18 meters per second. Think of this front here of the class. That's about 4 meters high. So that particle is falling that distance in about 2 seconds. 1 millimeter. Visualize 1 millimeter of particle. Density of 5,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And it falls that distance in 2 seconds in water. Seem reasonable? Too fast? Too fast. OK. So sub in, we've got that velocity. Our plan is, the next step is to calculate the Reynolds number, to make sure that that assumption 
was, was valid. Anyone got a chance to do that? No? Okay. So if you do that, I'll let you, um, if you haven't done it at home already, I really encourage you when I leave small problems for you at the end of the class to actually go do them. Um, so if you go do that, you calculate the Reynolds number is 2180. You'll see I'm not big in this course on substituting in values and working out mathematics for you on the board. It's, I would be insulting your intelligence if I was doing that. It's first year stuff. So Reynolds number 2000, clearly we're violating that assumption. We don't, not in that re region. So our plan is then, well, if this velocity is 2.18, the Reynolds number is 2000, let's go use Reynolds number of about 2000 and recalculate that drag coefficient. Clearly, we were not in the right region. So now it says we should probably use this drag coefficient here. CD is 0.44. So we can state that by saying our assumption is not true. Okay, so we were using this revised assumption, so now use CD of 0.44. And if we do that, you recalculate the terminal settling velocity, but this time you have to use that quadratic expression. Stokes' law, the simplified equation does not hold. So we have to use the general equation over here on slide 21. This equation holds for all conditions. So summing into that equation now, we know our rows, our G, our DP, CD, and row F. We can calculate that terminal settling velocity. You can sub in those values there for yourself, and you get 0 0.345 meters per second. That's substantially lower. So it's one, one third of a meter that gets traveled by that particle in one second. So now it would take about 12 seconds for that particle to fall, the distance of the front face of this classroom. 12 seconds seems more reasonable, okay? And that's exactly what step five in our program is here, to check, and six is to generalize. So essentially what we've done there is that check. Does 0.345 meters per second seem reasonable? Always, always check that and state that in your problem when you're writing this up in a test or a midterm or even in your professional work. Indicate whether that value seems reasonable. Okay. So let's check our Reynolds number again. If we go back to our plan, uh, we're just simply iterating through this plan one more time. Check Reynolds number there at step three. And if you do that, using that terminal settling velocity, we get a Reynolds number of 345. So that's just coincidence that it's, it's like that. Okay, so what's next? Do we stop there? Okay, so 345, it's that assumption now, remember we used CD of 0.44. That assumption is that our Reynolds number is in that particular range between 1,000 and two, to the pi of five, 2 times 10 to the 5. So we're now actually at Reynolds number 345. We're back into the second region. <laughs> so we're, we're bouncing around a little bit, and hopefully we're going to converge. And if you do another iteration of this, you will recalculate your Reynolds, uh, your CD now using that formula. So I'll simply state up here that if you repeat this another iteration, you can prove to yourself that your CD this time is 0.65. Okay. So now if CD is 0.65, you can recalculate your terminal settling velocity using that quadratic formula, and you get a terminal settling velocity of 0 0.28 meters per second. So not very different. We've gone from... from 34 centimeters per second to 28 centimeters per second. And if you check your Reynolds number, then after that, Reynolds number now is 280. So our Reynolds number has gone from 2,000 to 345 to 280. Our change is much smaller. You can do one more iteration if you really would like to, and then you converge to a value of 27 centimeters per second. Okay. 
So always, always do this check. Does it seem reasonable? A particle of one millimeter, it seems reasonable that it would take one second to fall about the distance of this page. Okay, that, that seems kind of okay. It's, it's within our realm of expectation. Any questions on that problem? Yeah, sure. If we're doing like a test, um, how close do you want it to get to converge? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. Um, you would use, you could stop right here, right? And, and simply state, look, my Reynolds number's gone from 345, and as I, I didn't show it here, but let me just put it down here. Your next step, if you did it, I'm running out of space, unfortunately. Your Reynolds number's 280. It's not a big difference, right? Reynolds numbers span a huge range. So the difference between 345 and 280 is almost imperceptible. Okay. Anything else on that problem? Okay, so what I'd like to move to next then is um, maybe just a quick announcement since everyone's here. Firstly, the assignment for next week is posted on the website, so that's due next week in Wednesday in class. And you can do that in two ways. You can either submit a paper submission or you're welcome to submit electronically. So it's a very short assignment. Electronic submissions, though, are very specific. For those of you that are not aware of how I run electronic submissions, there's some very careful criteria you must follow. They're listed on the website, several bullet points. You share, make sure you share it with the correct email addresses. It's done in Google Docs in the correct way. The advantage is, of course, that you don't need to come to class to submit it. Your assignment will never get lost. The TA is graded electronically. You get instantaneous feedback the moment the TA is graded. Um, whereas paper versions, you have to wait a little bit to get that back. And um, you have to obviously make sure you come to class to both drop off your assignment and pick it up. So we offer both options to you. We don't constrain you to, f to, to submit electronically. Um, you are certainly welcome to do so, but as long as you follow the requirements. Okay. So that assignment's posted and due next Wednesday at class. The next part of this section that I'd like to look in is asking why have we focused on terminal settling velocity so much? Well, really the answer is terminal settling velocity is telling us how fast our particles separate from the liquid that they're in. Our goal here is to separate that particle from the liquid phase and the terminal settling velocity as you've seen in this formula, let's just go back here quick, um, is very much a function of the environment that it's in the density of the fluid. CD captures the Reynolds number, which has got the viscosity of the fluid in there as well. G, which we generally ca cannot change. The only thing that we can change is DP, the particle diameter. The particle density is not something you're going to practically change. You're separating a given particle, that's what you have to separate, but the diameter of the particle is something you can generally adjust. And so when we look at that, the terminal settling velocity is going to be slowest for the smallest particle. The smaller the dp, the lower the settling velocity. And that simply tells us we have to wait a longer time. So our limiting particle is the smallest particle in the mixture. And that's why we've been focusing on that. I do also want to consider now the case of where we're going to break our assumptions. I, we've really been focusing on a single particle settling but what happens if there's other particles around it? Okay, so a very high concentration of particles. Well then, these laws that we've been looking at break down. There's problems that start to happen. And one way that we can look at this is by what's called the concept of hindered settling. So let me, let, let me have someone else explain hindered settling for you because they've got some nice animations which I don't have. of uh, free settling where the bigger particles settle faster than the smaller ones. The red's the biggest, the blue's intermediate and the yellow's the smallest and basically they're settling without any interference with each other which is why we say free settling. Happens at low concentrations. Uh, if we move up above a concentration of about 1% by weight then we move into hindered settling and you can see now we have the red, the yellow and the blue particles again but they're not settling 
like they were if free settling. They're settling what's called en masse. They're, they're settling under what's called hindered settling. And if we were to trace the interface, that's the boundary between the settling solids and the completely clear liquid called the supernatant that's left behind, then that interface plotted against time looks like the graph on the right. It's a straight line and then reaches a period where it starts to curve over a little bit and eventually becomes flat when everything's settled out. So that's hindered settling and that's the classic height against time plot and it's the plot of the interface during hindered settling. We can get a lot of information from that, that plot uh, by careful analysis. And this is the illustration of the zones that occur. There's the interface, interface plot on the left-hand side now. And if we take a fixed point in time, the zones are shown on the right. There's the supernatant, the clear liquid, the original concentration zone, variable concentration zone, and then sediment at the bottom. And that's at a position, fixed position in time, T. And here is some sedimentation. Uh, this is a fairly fast sedimentation. It's normally a, a much slower process than this and uh, typically performed in batch jars like this, measuring cylinders like this. The good news from the design point of view is that the sedimentation rate is not dependent on the vessel area. So laboratory tests using measuring cylinders are very good for designing industrial thickness much, much bigger. Yeah, that's industrial devices, much, much bigger in area for separations. And you can see there was an interface. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can probably see that interface a little bit better. There's no... Here we go. There's a, another shaking up and settling. And you can see the interface quite clearly now. The supernatant liquid is not completely clear, but it's, it's not bad. There's just a very, very, very few solids left there. And if we were to plot this against time, we would see that it had a, a straight line and eventually a curve. And then when it was fully settled, it would just become a plateau. And this is an unusually fast sedimenting system. Most things settle much slower than this. Sedimentation is very much light because it's cheap, it's gravity driven, so the energy requirements are, are very minimal. And you can see that we're just, the interface is now just coming below the gradations on the measuring cylinder and it's pretty much going to finish somewhere around there. So that was a very high concentration. If we had that much lower concentration it would have settled much faster. Here we have uh, a more realistic system. This is uh, gypsum, which is flue gas desulfurization gypsum from power stations. Uh, five measuring cylinders at different concentrations. In fact, the lowest concentrations on the left, the highest concentrations on the right. And we're not going to wait for those to settle. Here they have settled. And you can see that the, uh, this isn't fully settled. This is at the same period in time. And on the left, we've got quite a low sediment. And on the right, we've got quite a high sediment. They're still settling. And if we zoom in a little bit, you'll certainly be able to see the clarity of the supernatant. Again, it's not crystal clear, but it's not bad at the higher concentrations. That's the highest concentration on the right. And then those three there are reasonable concentrations. And the two lowest concentrations on the left, you can see clearly that, uh, again, the supernatant is not bad, but it's a little bit cloudy. So that's the batch process happening there. Now we'd like to do that on a continuous basis on a larger scale. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at next. Tangle this. Okay, so on a larger scale, we're going to, I'll show you the device to do this, but all that theory we looked at in the prior class in that example on a single particle settling kind of goes away. It's not, I didn't do it for no reason though, we're going to reuse that later on, but the general, prin and the general principles hold. But what I want to make sure that you're clear on is that when we're dealing with a whole lot of particles together, it's hindered settling, 
that those particles are now hindered or disturbed by the others. Hindered settling also works when we have non-spherical particles and the concentration is much higher. And when we've got higher concentrations of particles, it modifies the density and the viscosity of the environment that it's in. And so what we can often do is we can take that Stokes's equation and use modification factors to it to adjust that equation and then still work with the Stokes's law, but with modified densities and viscosities. Okay. Now, the large, let me just uh, jump here to this case here. The larger scale version of that test tube example you saw in the video is one of these units here. So this is now operating on a continuous basis. And for those of you that not, haven't seen the wastewater treatment process or seen a f been to one of these plants, let's just quickly be clear on what's, what's flowing where in this device. Um, let me show you a photo of one, first of all. So you may have seen these along the highway. And, and many times, uh, every municipality has one of these largest wastewater treatment basins. So let's take a look at the diagram and, and what's going on inside there. At the center, we have our feed. So these basins typically have a conical shape at the bottom. And our feed comes in in the center. So in a continuous basis, we're flowing material in. So our solids and our liquid mixture is coming in that feed. And we have to feed it in very carefully because we don't want to rush this fluid in and disturb the settling that's currently happening. The settling that's currently happening is that these solid particles are moving down to the bottom very much as you saw there in those, in those, uh, those white cylinders that were in the video. And the voice over made a very important statement. The cylinder can be used to scale up and design one of these larger scale units because it's independent of the diameter. So that test tube example that you use, the rate at which that height falls in the lab is exactly the same rate as which it will fall in one of these which are 20, 30 meters in diameter or sometimes larger. So we can absolutely use the lab scale process to design the larger scale process. That's a really important point. We don't need to make any modification for that. So what happens then, and this is going to be a little, takes a little bit of wrapping your head around, but what we've taken is that lab case where we've got the lab test tube and that height is falling down over time and that's a batch process. Now we're moving here to a continuous process. This is why reactor design is important. Not just for designing reactors, but also for thinking about the relationship between batch and continuous systems. On a continuous basis, there isn't, there is not a height that's constantly falling down here. On a continuous process, you're continually feeding new solids in, and this height between what the voice called the supernatant, or another term for that is overflow. So that liquid, the clearer liquid phase, and the interface between the solids down here, which is called sludge, stays roughly at the same place. As long as the solids concentration coming in and the flow rate coming in is constant, that height stays roughly at the same place. Because particles are settling and the solids are being withdrawn. So it's emphasized that that's wet solids but mostly solid phase is constantly being withdrawn and this overflow is constantly overflowing down to the next step in the flow sheet. Okay? So it's obvious to some of you, but I do want to emphasize the distinction between the batch example that you saw in the lab with that interface continually falling and the continuous process that that interface stays at roughly the same point in height. Okay? And a lot of the design of this unit is around how this material is fed in to the tank so that you don't disturb that interface. You, not, you don't want to gush this water in and uh, disturb that settling interface. So what happens there is um, there's some sophisticated feed, feed um, entry 
designs. I'll just jump ahead since we're on that topic. So here, for example, you see a feed coming in and it's split into two pieces and they're flowed counter current to each other so that it breaks the momentum of the feed. So the two feed streams come flow right against each other at equal velocity and they, they stop and then get fed into the tank. And that's one, one particular design. There's a lot of other particular designs for specific cases, but the main point is that you don't want a turbulent flow coming in to disrupt the careful settling that's taking place. Okay, so I'll just, just mention that at that point. Okay, so we've covered essentially those, those pieces. And the, the very important point I want to emphasize from that video is the use of lab results to design these larger scale systems. Um, so in a chemical process, I've, w with the, one of the co-ops that I did several years ago, we did a lot of these tests. There was a particular waste stream that we had to treat, and we just did take a simple cylinder from the lab measure the rate at which that sludge falls down, and we use that velocity to design the settler area. Okay, so I'll show you some of those equations in the class next week. So that's what we're heading to. And that's the sort of curve that we use to design those units. That solid liquid interface moves down at a constant rate in the lab test tube, and then reaches a point at which it slows down and then is fully settled out in the last image over there. Any questions on the understanding that batch to continuous relationship? Okay. Not just yet. Good. Now, when we use those curves, these settling curves coming down, there's two approaches. And my goal with this course isn't that we become experts at designing settling vessels. I do want to point you though to two references which are given at the end of, this, of the notes. The first one there is well known to slightly over design the area and the second one uses a different technique from that curve and it, it generally under designs the, the surface area. Why are we designing for the area of the vessel? Any guesses? Why is it not the depth of the vessel that we're concerned about? Sean? Because you hit a total velocity and you're scraping sludge off the bottom. So if everything's moving, each like, layer has its own speed. Yeah. Just, the area is just like how much you can fit in it. Right. So the area is essentially telling you the capacity of the unit, how much material you can treat per hour. The depth really isn't too important, and I'll prove it to you next week. The depth really doesn't matter too much. As long as you get settling occurring within the depth of interest, but it doesn't make any sense to go to a, a deeper unit. It doesn't get you any better separation. Right? The separation occurs at this interface, so as long as that interface is somewhere in the vessel, you're going to get separation you're not going to get any better separation by going to double the depth. Okay? If you go to double the diameter, though, you're now spreading out that material, you get less concentrated, and what you can then essentially do is treat material at a faster rate. Okay? So we'll come to that subtlety next week, but I just want you to hold that idea in your head for now. And that area of the vessel is the design criterion, not depth. Okay, so if we look at those curves as well, and you saw there in the, in the video, the person was talking about treating a, a flue gas from a desulfurization power plant. Um, the concentration of the material can be adjusted by, by you as the engineer. Okay? You can choose to dilute your material, and then what you'll get is a faster settling curve or you can go to a more concentrated material and you'll get a slower settling curve. Okay, and that will play into the design of the area. So 
another option for you to design this plant and its performance is to not only vary the area, though once you've built the unit that area is fixed, but then the next step that you can vary is the concentration, this ratio between solid and liquid coming in. That is a parameter that's within your control. Remember I said this whole course is about how you as the engineer can optimize and improve the process and what you can change to improve things. There's one, num one parameter that you can adjust is that ratio. Okay? And what that will do is that ratio will affect the speed with which the particles settle and that will then affect the, the clarity of your overflow or supernatant. Now, the question that often comes up is, well, I've built this unit, I've got this fixed device, I'm not quite getting the clarity that I would like, my particles are not settling fast enough. Okay, so if you're not getting the clarity that you'd like, what does that mean? It means that this sludge level, instead of being down here, is pretty, is higher up, which means your solids, instead of settling down to the bottom, are also being drawn into the overflow. So you're not getting the clarity or the, the amount of separation that you'd like. Your separation factor is too low or too high? Too low. You're getting a low separation factor. So thinking back to this equation, what can you change in the system to get a faster velocity? So if we go back to this quadratic, what can you change practically to get a faster velocity and move this interface further down in the vessel? Can you change G? Okay. Can you change rho P? Probably not. You have to treat a given solid stream. Can you change rho F? You can change rho F. Okay, so let's hold that one. Can you change DP? Yes, no, maybe? Maybe. Can you change CD? the drag coefficient. How would you change the drag coefficient? Sorry? Change the Reynolds number. How do you change the Reynolds number? Use a different viscosity, okay? So viscosity of the fluid. Okay, so viscosity of the fluid we can modify by temperature adjustment of that stream. <laughs> Now, if we're treating a large body of wastewater, we probably don't want to be heating up all that liquid to get a viscosity reduction. And also because temperature has an effect on reducing viscosity, but you have to put in a really large amount of temperature or heat energy to get that reduction in viscosity. So it's doable, but expensive. This is going to cost you a lot of money to do that. Okay. Rho F can also be adjusted by adjusting temperature. But again, the temperature dependence of density of the fluid with the temperature is a low one, right? Water doesn't change density a whole lot, even over 20, 30 degrees Celsius. And that's a whole lot of energy to be putting into the system to get a small reduction in, this, in density. But one thing we can do practically is change the particle size. And we can do that with a process of what's called coagulation or flocculation. So I'm going to show you this video because, again, I recognize at certain points in this course there's people that have put tremendous amount of effort and resources into creating teaching materials better than I could ever do. And I'd like you to watch this video created by MIT students in describing what flocculation is. How many of you are familiar with that term? Yeah? Okay, so some of you are. Let's take a look and see what, what flocculation is doing. and other parts of the left. Let's do a small experiment. Would you rather drink this water or this water? Well, of course you would choose the water on the left. Unfortunately, some people in other parts of the world have no choice at all. 
Did you know that small floating particles in drinking water can make you sick? Imagine we have a super powerful microscope and we can zoom into the water. Zoom! What will we find? What are these small floating particles and how do they float? These particles are of two types. Inorganic, like clay, silt, and mineral oxides. And organic, such as algae, protozoa, and bacteria. The bacteria, once ingested by humans, can sometimes be fatal. All of these small particles are able to float because they are not heavy enough to settle to the bottom by gravity. Suspended particles that are too light and small to settle are called colloids. When looked at together, these colloids cause a state of cloudiness or haziness known as turbidity. The more cloudy a fluid looks, the more turbid it is. Here we see four beakers of water with increasing levels of turbidity from left to right. There is a relation between turbidity and the risk of getting a disease. Science shows that the more turbid the drinking water is, the higher the risk of getting sick is. Now, why is this? This is because toxic compounds can adsorb, that is, stick to, the surface of the suspended colloids. The more colloids there are, the more toxic the water can become. These toxic materials and bacteria can cause cholera, salmonellosis, hepatitis A, dysentery, and E. coli infection. These illnesses affect and kill millions of people a year and are especially dangerous to children whose weak immune systems cannot provide an adequate defense. Fortunately, we can do something about this. One of the very practical ways to clean this turbid water is called flocculation. Flocculation is the process in which colloids aggregate or come together to form larger particles called flocks by the addition of a chemical called a flocculant. Typical flocculants include alum and ferrix because they work well with high turbidity fluid mixtures. Now, let's demonstrate how flocculation works. First, we'll need to go out and collect some muddy water from the Charles River. Here are two beakers filled with the same amount of muddy Charles River water. On the left is our control, which will remain untouched, and on the right, we'll add three milliliters of prepared flocculent solution. Then we'll stir for two minutes and wait. <coughs> wow! What just happened? The colloids in the turbid water on the left may never settle, whereas with the addition of just a little bit of flocculant, the water on the right became clear. In order to make this water potable, it will require skimming and filtration and maybe some additional treatment. If you're wondering what's going on, let's explain how this flocculant business works. Almost all colloids have negatively charged surfaces. This means that positive ions, or charged particles in water, will attract to the colloid surface, forming a first layer. Recall how like poles of a magnet will repel, while opposite poles will attract. The same occurs with colloids in water. A diffuse layer made up of a mix of positive and negative ions will then surround the first, forming what is called a double layer. <coughs> this double layer provides a repulsive force that prevents two colloids from sticking to each other. Once the flocculant is added, it adheres to the surfaces of the particles. Compressing the double layer and allowing the colloids to stick to each other and form flocks. These flocks are now heavy enough to settle to the bottom by gravity. Given how effective flocculation is, many countries around the world use this method for cleaning their water supplies. Did you know that Singapore, for instance, produces drinking water from sewer water using a number of methods including flocculation? As the global population increases and fresh water resources become more and more scarce, flocculation is one tool that can supply clean, healthy, and tasty drinking water <coughs> worldwide.
Okay, so essentially what flocculation is doing there for us is forming larger particles. That DP now goes up and the particles settle faster and we get the clarity in the supernatant that we're looking for. Or turbidity was the term that was used there in the video. Lack of, tur uh, lack of turbidity or it is the same as clarity in the drinking water. Now, I want you to think back to that example we started off in today's class where we looked at a particle of one millimeter in diameter and it had a settling time of about 27 centimeters per second. But particle separation of one, meter, one millimeter in diameter is not the typical particle size we're dealing with in wastewater. Particles in wastewater treatment are much, much smaller. So then in the order of the micrometer range, those are the particles that are biologically active, the toxic compounds and, and so forth, and those will never settle pretty much. Beyond a certain size, those particles even left for an infinite time will not settle, and that's simply because of Brownian motion. There was one other force that we neglected in our force balance back at the start of this class, and that was Brownian motion. That force is keeping smaller particles in suspension permanently. And they will never settle beyond a, sm a small particle size range. But in this range of about 40 to 50 micrometers and about 100, sorry, I should say about 200 micrometers, that's a range of particles that will settle given enough time, but would take an unreasonably long period. We would have to build a settling vessel that's hundreds of meters in diameter in order to get those particles to settle fast enough to treat a given amount of water. So our resort then is to this chemical treatment of the process to bring those particles together, forming larger DP, and then we get faster settling. Okay, so that's the essential principle of flocculation. And here again, we're stuck. We're stuck using lab results because we cannot predict how much flocculant to add, and how big those particles will be. It's, a, it's, it's beyond our level of technical expertise and modeling to do that, right? So there are, there are some references you can go look at that tells you which flocculants to use to treat a given type of wastewater, but every single wastewater treatment process that uses flocculation will have lab experiments behind it to, just to empirically verify what the settling rates are. It's not something we can predict from first principles and derive equations for and tell us how much flocculant to add. Okay. So, so this is really uh, an interesting part of wastewater treatment and it's, a, it's almost, for those that are researching it, if you, uh, <clears throat> um, I'll talk about the water week that's happening at Mac in October next week. We're bringing a whole lot of researchers to campus that specialize in the water treatment area one of them is uh, Dr. David Lutulip in our department who will be there and one of his students, Jeff Kobeldick, who was in this class last year and has done some work on, on flocculation. They'll be presenting at that, but their research in the department right now is focused on these choices of flocculants. There's no first principles way we can predict what the right flocculant is to treat a given type of wastewater. It's very experimental, very iterative, and time consuming. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, actually to the people in, in this class that are in the 4L labs. I'll be talking about that next week to you guys. But um, the key thing is the way that this is typically done right now is you, you write uh, an email to a flocculant supply company and they'll send you 20, 25 small little samples of flocculant and you go try each one of them on your wastewater. And just keep going through all the combinations at different concentrations of flocculant until you find one that roughly works in one of those cylinder tests. And then that's the one you buy. And that's pretty much the state of the art is where we are, right? So there's a lot of research and scope to improve that process. Um, that's something that any of you that are considering a career in water treatment could look into. It would be a great, great step forward if we could speed up that iterative, time-consuming process. Okay, but the key is that the chemistry of what's going on at that surface is so complex, we cannot model it from an engineering perspective. Okay, any questions on that so far? Any comments? We've been very quiet this morning. <laughs> okay, so the, I've spoken about this 
and uh, just to come back to it and why this, why this feed, I'll just emphasize it, is so important is once you have flocculated your solids and you've formed these larger conglomerations of particles, that's not a rigid solid particle. That particle is only held together by the chemical bonds between the particles. And so as easily as it was to form that particle, it's easier still to break it back up again into the smaller pieces. So when you're feeding your material into this separation basin, it's critical not to disrupt the flocculated particles. Okay, because one thing that happens is just upstream from this in the flow sheet is the flock formation step. Okay, so just prior to entering the wastewater treatment process, you would have just flocculated your solids. They would have just formed the, those agglomerates. And now if you bring them in here in a very turbulent type way, you're just going to break them apart again. You've lost all benefits of what you've done. What some companies have looked at um, doing is even doing that flocculation step right here, just as you add it in, to give less time to disrupt that solid. But if you flocculate upstream, there's the tendency that along this pipe, any turbulent flow, any elbows in the pipe would simply disrupt those particles back to smaller pieces again. So all the companies doing water research have patterns and very closely guarded designs around how to flocculate and feed into that separation basin so that you still get the maximum benefit. Flocculants are not cheap chemicals. Um, some of them are fairly cheap. But if, you tr if you're looking at treating hundreds and hundreds of meters cubed of water, there's a lot of chemical reagent cost on flocculation. So the last thing you want to do is spend the money to flocculate your solids and then break them back up again. Okay, so you don't want to be doing that. Okay, so I think I'll leave it at that point for today's class. What we'll look at in next class is how to design this type device, this separation basin.